Welcome to the Scratch Pad, where each week we give you a glimpse into the messy background of sermon creation. It's also a chance for you to ask some questions. So scratch that itch of yours and send in your questions. We'll do our best to answer them. Welcome to the Scratch Pad. Uh, this is a platform where we compare notes, uh, the preacher's notes and your notes. Uh, I am Zwai Zulu, the pastor of discipleship here at Rosebank. Uh, joining me today is the preacher of the week, our senior pastor, Richard von Lissot. Uh, good morning, Pastor Rich. It's so good to have you uh, this morning to discuss this week's sermon. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good, man. Got lots to talk about today. This, <laughs> I think the sermon was super long as it was, <laughs> but there's just so much more to talk about. So mm. looking forward to sure. some unhurried time with you to yeah. process some more of my thinking and our thinking on this. Yeah, yeah, man. Uh, in your sermon, you took us through the subject of the law. Uh, by unpacking, you know, what the law is, you know, um, and I really enjoy that part just, you know, because there's so many, you know, references to the law in scripture. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I think it was just good to, to clarify, you know, those things. And I think the section on the Torah, you know, just a better translation of that mm. being instruction, you know, uh, I really enjoyed that. So, yeah, Richard, just take us through, you know, um, to what we didn't get into, you know, during your sermon. So what we didn't get into was I think there was two, uh, as, I, as I got into the passage and I was telling Michael and you guys around the office, like my struggle was there were two major rabbit holes mm -hmm. in the passage uh, that were related, but in many ways, very separate topics. So the one was the whole subject of the law and uh, in, in essence, as a Christian, how are we supposed to view all of mm. the commandments in the Bible and the yes. seemingly archaic law code of the Old Testament, a massive, massive rabbit hole. And sure. uh, I really felt like that was super important for us to, to get our heads around, but it is so yeah. vast, so huge. I actually ended up um, rewriting the entire sermon on sure. Saturday night. So after <laughs> I'd submitted it for slides and et cetera, just because you know, really wrestled a lot with how to bring it across in a way that was clear, yeah. um, but still a massive rabbit hole. So I think we are going to go back to that today and mm -hmm. chat through some more, some more details there because it's such an important subject and so open, I think, to misunderstanding. But then there was another massive rabbit hole yes. that I had to exercise immense discipline to not include <laughs> because it was intriguing and I think it would have been great. In fact, I was super close to doing it as the sermon in the evening service. Oh. Um, I'd kind of written it up and was ready to do that and then felt like, no, I mean, the subject of the law is really important for the guys coming in the evening too. So yeah. I didn't want to shortchange them and, and do the, the interesting subject. So, so what I want to do maybe first is to mm. go into the rabbit hole number two, yes, uh, which comes up in um, verse four to eight. So maybe, maybe yeah. you read that for us. Yeah, I can read that verse. Uh, it says, uh, not to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promotes speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Sure. So the big rabbit hole there is kind of the idea of what, what the, uh, end, the endless genealogies. Yes, yes, the myths. And the myths, yeah. like what, what that is referring to. Mm. And uh, maybe I could just start by kind of highlighting how, how big a deal this is for Paul in his letters, because yeah. it's not just a little reference here in the, in the opening. I mean, I said in my sermon that it's kind of the, the context of this passage is false teachers. They do yes. two things. One, it's an incorrect use of the law, mm. rabbit hole number one that we went down. Sure. But number two, what they were doing, what he's urging Timothy to remove these guys from doing is that A, they're teaching different doctrine, but B, they're devoting themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Yeah. So he's, he, it's a big deal there. But listen to these other passages from the pastoral epistles. So Titus 3 verse 9, mm -hmm. Paul says, But avoid foolish controversies, 
genealogies, dissensions, mm. and quarrels about the law, mm. for they are unprofitable and worthless. So there's a reminder to, to Titus there. And then 2 Timothy chapter mm. 2, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. Sure. You know that they breed quarrels. Mm. First Timothy chapter 6 is still in the same letter, but chapter yeah, 6 says, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions. Hmm. So it's not just like a once-off here yeah. in the opening. I mean, even in the opening, it's a big deal. It's part yeah. of what describes a false teacher, yeah. but it's a, a theme in the letter, yeah. this that idea of these controversies that lead mm. to foolish yeah. babbling and yeah. yeah it comes up actually in, in again in verse 20 of chapter 6 where he says guard the deposit entrusted to you avoid the irreverent babble and ah. contradictions yeah you know of what is falsely called knowledge for by professing it some have swerved mm -hmm. from the faith you know grace be with you so yeah it's good it's good yeah, so it's a it's a big deal, right? So yeah. that's why I wanted to go down this rabbit hole because I think I think that there is a very direct contemporary application here. Yeah. So um, I think it's quite simply it's the subject of conspiracy theories. Yeah. So maybe it would be helpful before I even jump into that rabbit hole to just kind of to make sure people are on the same page that we you know this is how it's relevant today is a, a myth. Basically, myth used here is a fable, a story, or a or a fairy tale. Yeah. So it's a it's something that's been added that is intriguing, yeah. is speculative, yeah. either arises out of the genealogies or out of extra biblical stories that have been added. So, for example, I heard this. Um, Alistair Begg, a sermon I listened to on this, so he's a Scottish yes. Presbyterian dude, listen to sometimes. But he was saying that what these guys, what it's referring to, these myths, is some of the rabbinical discussions are kind of in the Talmud, mm. speculating on some of the events in the Old Testament yes. that aren't there and adding them in. And he referenced this example of this belief that the angels uh, were circumcised. <laughs> And, you know, sure. which is nowhere in the Bible, mm. but he says it's there in like, in like some of these Jewish speculations and stories, you know, which would be this idea of a fable, a myth, and it's intriguing and it leads you down all sorts of places. Now, I, I actually searched for that because mm. I thought, man, like, is that really there? Yeah. I couldn't find it. So, sure. I mean, I need to just say a disclaimer, <laughs> you know, I'm quoting Alistair Begg, quoting that yeah. as an example of what's happening here. These very intriguing, mm. speculative things being sure. added to scripture and being added to the discussion, mm. uh, that that's, that's what Paul is referring to here as sure. myths and endless mm. genealogies. genealogies. But yeah. it leads to controversy, yeah. speculation, slander. And so directly for us today, it's a subject of conspiracy theories. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there are so many conspiracy theories. I mean, even around the COVID-19 vaccine, there's just so much For sure. that people have put out there. And I think because we're living in an era where there's a lot of information flowing. So with that, you know, we, we has come misinformation. And I think it's all the more relevant for us to be actually discussing this and looking at what Paul was warning because the result of it is, you know, it's just there's endless, you know, discussions that, that are not bearing any fruit. And so he's Correct. warning the church about that. Yeah. And I think we need to definitely take heed uh, of, of his warning. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's even uh, before we even get into some chatting about why we, why we fall for these things. But yeah, the outcome of it mm. is, as you said, these just endless discussions. But mm. what these verses that we read earlier, it's also the, the discussions lead to quarrels yeah. and dissensions. It's fighting amongst Christians. Sure. And I mean, that's just true. Yeah. A lot of the conspiracy theory stuff is dividing mm. households. I mean, I had sure. questions like that, like people just asking, like, what do I do if, you know, in my house, there's maybe someone who's, you know, anti-vax and we're not going to get in, into that sure. necessarily as a, as a conspiracy theory, but like these kinds of things where mm. Christians are divided. Yeah. 
over the and that's what that's what worries us yeah. is the division. But also Paul's concern here is that people have wandered away from, from and the swerved, faith, swerved exactly. Away, yeah. So there's it actually leads to a mm. damaging of your faith. Yeah. Um and that's certainly what we want mm. to prevent. I think at the very least it's become for a lot of people sure. an obsession, an unhealthy yeah. craving yeah. is the words Paul uses, which yeah. for me is an obsession, sure. an addiction. Um, and I think just is not building up. So it's leading people. So I think for all of those reasons, we need to take some time to like yeah. unpack. And I think it's important <laughs> to note theories, that so. these myths are untrue. You know, I just think at the very basic level, they are yeah. untrue, they are deceptive. Um, you know, I was I was reading around the whole subject of myths. And one of the commentaries said, you know, such myths were often used to excuse immoral behavior. You know, and so people would use these. Um, um, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and genealogists yeah. here, they seem to refer to some speculative use of the Old Testament accounts, uh, you know, of biblical characters or family trees. So just people were just drawn into that stuff. Hmm. Uh, but that stuff, as you said, was producing quarrels within the church. You know, those are not important things, you know. Not unimportant things. You yeah. Mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying like, yeah. you know, the, the main thing yeah. here is people have moved from dealing with the core, yes. you know, which, which is what we're going to get into, yes. you know, in this coming series. I mean, this coming uh, sermon, this coming Sunday, you know, we'll be looking into what is the remedy or what, is, what should the churches be focusing on? Mm. Yeah, maybe actually be helpful as well. I promise we'll get to <laughs> the intriguing research about why we fall for conspiracy theories. But mm. you know, one of the other parts maybe in the passage didn't get to explain a little bit is that verse four, um, which speaks about mm. um, so so what these um, myths or what we're saying conspiracy theories today what they do is they promote speculations rather than the stewardship, stewardship from God that is by faith. And that phrase, the stewardship from God that is by faith, is an interesting uh, uh, phrase. Maybe I'll just go into it um, mm -hmm. a, a little bit, but it's basically uh, the word is built around actually household. So household of God, it's built around this metaphor, um, God's redemptive plan. So it's almost like um, a household management Strategy. So, so in other words, if you have a household steward, someone who runs the household, yeah. they're basically entrusted with all of the works and the management of the house. Yes. So it's actually used in passages like Ephesians uh, three, uh, Ephesians one and Ephesians three, which speaks of God's redemptive plan. Mm -hmm. And so it's this large term of stewardship over this grand strategy of redemption. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what's happening here is these foolish controversies, these conspiracy theories, these mm -hmm. vain arguments, these quarrels, these discussions are diverting people away from this great redemptive plan Absolutely. that we are yeah. meant to steward and manage. So yeah. I think just emphasizing again, maybe hopefully mm -hmm. by now guys get our <laughs> the, the yeah. danger of this. Yeah. So. Do you have do you have any uh, conspiracy theories that you've heard in recent days? Yeah, I think. Um, look, we were spared a little bit here in South Africa recently from just I think the wave of the conspiracy theories uh, in the states around the the general elections, mm. you know, and around Donald Trump and the predictions sure. uh, about him coming to power um, and the Antifa connections. And there was a, just a ton swirling out there yeah. uh, that, and Christians just got caught up in mm. these controversies, these conspiracy theories. I mean, and the, even the storming of the Capitol, all of those events yes. became very Christianized mm. because of their links to conspiracy theories. Mm. And it, I think it was super, um, diff I think it, ma it made a bad impression on the church. So, no. you know, I think we didn't hear too much of that here. Like as pastors here, yeah, we didn't have to deal with that. But like yeah. colleagues in the States were Didn't really needing to be on top of, yeah. you know, these links, these conspiracy theories, links between mm. uh, presidential elections and uh, all sure. these sorts of things. So that that's sort of in my mind. Mm. Um, closer to home, I think, um, it, you know, we dealt with a little bit in that first Monday's webinar around COVID-19, as yes. you said, you know, like things such as it was created in a laboratory, yeah. especially, you know, to make money, you know, things like that, yeah. and um, which everybody's talking about. It's not just Christian things, yes. but I think a lot of 
Christians have gone down some serious rabbit holes there yeah. that I, I'm not sure has been super useful. So we're not going to talk about that because I think yeah. we had a webinar about it. But that's obviously in my mind as well. Mm. Um, yeah, on a Christian level, you know, and I promise we will get to the <laughs> the reasons we do this. But on a Christian level, I think even sometimes, if I think about some of these um controversial speculations about some of these empty discussions, some of these quarrels, these unhealthy dissensions. Mm. I think of even the arena of like ministry in terms of worship, you know, like what songs we sing and some of these quarrels, which may not be conspiracy theory related, but I think it's in the same category where there's like a connection to law there that's unhealthy, you know. So I think there's, there's the the core here is these conspiracy theories which we're going to get to but there is a general sense as well of this uh, christians being you know strongly worded here by paul to avoid mm. any kind of useless speculations or sure. fringe arguments that have yes. no legal i'm using inverted commas basis yeah. you know sure so yeah those are some of the things swirling in my mind okay yeah that's helpful rich and i think before we we get into uh the other the other subject which you did touch on you know the law mm. uh, there's a question that came through from from alan which was quite interesting you know uh so he says lee always taught from the niv but now we're using the ev if we are using the esv if i'm not mistaken not perturbed uh the teaching has been incredible, but just wanted to know why the change. Uh, can you tackle that? Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, got that in, and, and um, Alan was saying, man, you know, if, is it just a pastor's preference? And so, so I thought, well, I don't have to deal with that on the podcast, but actually mm-hmm. thought maybe it's good to bring in here because, uh, so just to answer quite simply, yes, it's just personal preference. Yeah. But behind use sure. of translations is yeah. a lot of conspiracy theory stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought maybe that's helpful to highlight because mm-hmm. I think it is something as well that, um, that know, could has enough. created some yeah. decision Sure. in Christianity with you know, people who perhaps hold to King James only uh, is that's the only valid translation of scripture but to simply answer the question is that uh, you know I've taught from the ESV so it's, it's my preference the yeah. Bible that I use in the pulpit is a Bible my wife gave me and she did this beautiful picture inside and everything and, and so sure. you know it really is preference but I thought mm. I do want to kind of flag what I think sometimes the discussion around translation when it gets to, for mm. example, the NIV, I've, I've read some of it where, for example, the publishing house uh, is owned by, you know, people that are aligned with satanic movements and it's mm. this deliberate plot to undermine the work of the church and, I, and I, there's conspiracy theory territory there. Yeah. So me using ESV, not NIV, I just wanted to clarify, is not because I believe there's is something there's, inherently yeah. wrong. Yeah. With that or any, I think there's some translations that are less helpful yes, the, than the other translations. Yes, the paraphrased ones, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the paraphrased ones. Um, yeah. But even then, some of the paraphrased ones, like, for example, Eugene Peterson's The Message, yeah. I would never sort of preach from and say, thus saith the Lord. Yeah. Um, but like if you use it in your own personal, it's like a commentary, like you're reading a passage and you're going, man, what does that what does mean? mean? And yeah. then you go read the paraphrase, you're like, okay, so you get the sense of it, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and I think it'd be helpful as like a, a tool, but I wouldn't yeah. you know, sort of teach from that as authoritative yeah. word of God. But so I, I just wanted to address that question because sure. A, I just wanted to flag the subject of Bible translations as oftentimes coming under this yeah. thing that divides Christians yeah. and is you know way more complex than I think people realize. And to sure. say, no, I teach from ESV because I uh, have <laughs> preference for it. But I think, yeah. you know, NIV is, is, is fine. In fact, when I, do all of my prep for sermons, like when we're going through a, a book especially, mm. I'll read through the passage in ESV and then I'll read through it in two other major translations. Yeah. So I'll do NIV and I'll do NET as well and okay. just compare them, see where the differences and the nuances are. So yeah, so, uh, yeah I thought yeah. we'd bring that up there. But before we move on to the subject of the law, mm. I wanted to share just some research I came across or some thoughts about why conspiracy theories are so attractive. Sure. To Christians and to people, because mm. there is a proliferation of it, and um, and I think there's some reasons behind it. And when we get to some of the reasons, 
I think will there'll be sufficient warning in them. So can I run through those real quick? Yeah, please. So third man, that'll be helpful. First year, just some research I came across uh, that one of the reasons people are attracted to conspiracy theories is it's called the cynical genius illusion. Hmm. The cynical genius illusion, which is basically this idea that the cynic, so the person who's always skeptical yeah. and wondering about the true nature of things, that there's this sense that, well, they, everyone else is the gullible ones mm. and the cynic is the one that's not gullible. And mm. so there's kind of this illusion that to be cynical is, is to be smarter yeah. in a way. And this research paper came across just like basically does research from um, th- 200,000 people across 20, 30 different countries, sorry, 200,000 people across 20 different countries mm. and the perception of kind of smarter people are cynics and in reality it's actually not true those who mm. perform highly in the workplace who do better actually don't hold this cynical view yeah. you know but basically the idea behind <laughs> it is this sense you know think about i don't know if you ever watched did you ever watch the series house no. It's a medical series where the like the main doctor, his name's Dr. House. He's like this super grumpy, <laughs> I mean, like, uh, you know, almost on the spectrum kind of guy, but he's absolutely cynical, but he's a genius. Like he solves sure. every single medical thing. And I think like that's something that like in, in movies and stuff, like Sherlock Holmes, think about mm. Sherlock Holmes, you know, like this kind of stereotype of this genius is yeah. this withdrawn, cynical, you know, mm. kind of person. And, and so part of the drawing to conspiracy theories, I think behind it is the sense that, you know, people are like, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be fooled. I'm going to be no. like, you know, like <laughs> everyone else is gullible, yeah, you I'm know, smart. but I'm, I'm, I'm smarter. And mm. I, I honestly, I think that for some people there is this sense of, you know, pride in, yes. In, in having secret knowledge. Mm. Seeing things different from the rest, right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Exactly. Seeing things different from the rest. It's mm. it's it's draw is especially maybe for mm. people who who have maybe felt insecure in mm. their sort of standing mm. intellectually with others, then can fall prey to this because it gives a sense of superiority. It gives yeah. a sense of this inside track, this secret mm knowledge you know and i think that's actually point you know point number two so reasons why we're drawn to it is is kind of this perception that you know cynics are smarter Mm. and so if you want to be smarter and not be gullible then you'll hold to some of these weird things but secondly uh, the draw card is just the enticement of secret knowledge (laughs) You know, to just be, to you know, yeah. to know a secret. Think about how yeah. good you feel when you know a secret nobody else you, knows. You have power. <laughs> you have power in inverted commas, right? Good point. Yeah. Absolutely, you got power. You yeah. feel important mm. when somebody shares something with you. Yeah. And behind all of this, as we're going to see, is, is, is one of the dangers is pride. Yeah. You know, so the cynical genius mm. or this secret wisdom, secret knowledge, and you feel important about it. But I think one of the warnings is, remember, like Genesis 3 verse 5, it was the tree of knowledge of good and evil that led to humanity's mm-hmm. downfall, right? So the devil enticed man and woman into sin with the promise of secret knowledge. Yeah, yeah. So, so like that's the danger sure. here. And for example, Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and our children forever that we may follow all the words of his law. And so it's kind of this idea that men, they, you know, secret knowledge belongs to God. Mm. Like there are things that we're not going to know. Yeah. There are things that we're not going to understand. And it's actually prideful to believe we have the right to know everything. Yeah. You know, and I think sure. this idea of secret knowledge is, it's a, it's a pride thing sometimes. It's behind yeah. it is this sort of hubris and being in on the secret mm. and, you know. It, it's massive in the African traditional religion. Mm. It is massive. I mean, I had a chat recently with a few family members, you know, so they know I'm a pastor and some believe they have certain gifts, you know, that the the ancestors have given them. And so it it can almost feel like this competition, you know, Mm. who's got the power. Okay. I'm like, man, I'm just a Christian. I'm I'm leading people to the Lord. That is my job. And, but this, 
this pursuit of you know of having power of having secret knowledge mm. uh, of you know foretelling certain things before mm. they happen like it's such a massive thing you know um in 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 ATR and i just think it's yeah i can see i can see this yeah correct yeah. yeah that's a great observation yeah i think it's just in different cultures in different ways but beneath a lot of it is mm. ultimately yeah. ultimately you know pride yeah um, yeah it is because it's i mean one of the the arguments or debates have led to what is the purpose of being sent by god right so the purpose is you know you're minister you're serving people mm. but in often case my observation is you know uh, this person i'm referring to is it's this knowledge that i possess power so this is pride i'm like mm-hmm. no actually it's supposed to be serving people so if right. you yeah. really have a gift you should be humble about it one and two it should be to serve people it's for people not it's for, for you. people yeah 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 so that's just no that's good man so so cynical genius illusion secret knowledge third and then there's one more after this but connected really to to what I've said before is this kind of outsider insider view so mm-hmm. i think again for people who've maybe struggled to feel included and accepted mm-hmm. that once you get into some of these circles like flat earth flat earth yeah. is let's say you know you become accepted as, yeah, as part, part of, of a, something yeah exactly yeah. um and again it's it's around that is this idea we are the ones who know and others mm. don't know and so there's this real sense of superiority coupled sure. with community mm. um and sure. i think that can often be a dangerous place for people to find identity and yeah. inclusion and acceptance and meet their need for significance is mm. that's why this is so has so much power yeah you know? and that's one of your hobby horses right uh, identity exactly yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> correct <laughs> the last one i think I like is, is a big one i think um and and after this i'll get into i'll, I'll paint another view of conspiracy theories before we go to the next part but um mm. other re- fourth reason why we i think are so susceptible to conspiracy theories is the illusion of control mm. the illusion this is a big one and i think for sure. everybody so i'm going to quote Um, Al Mola here, if you know him as a pastor, mm, but yes, he says, yeah, he says, we as human beings do not like unanswered moral questions. Mm. We want to know who did it. We want to know how it was done. We're looking for a pattern. Our intelligence given to us by God is a pattern seeking intelligence. And I think honestly, especially behind the COVID stuff is when it happened, mm. n- none of us knew like how to make sense of this mm-hmm. and the idea that we as humans are susceptible to mm-hmm. a global pandemic and are out of control one of the only ways that we could deal with it is believe while well, it's manufactured sure. because we can't think of a of a universe where we're not in control mm. and i think that's sure. part of what draws us into some of these conspiracy that's theories exactly. is there's a reason behind Everything. everything yeah whereas you know actually as as christians we largely be that they are but it's god and his sovereignty is allowing these things to pass mm. for certain reasons but like it's it's god and he's mm. sovereign the reason behind it isn't you know necessarily a wicked society of human beings who are trying to make money sure. off vaccines etc but i think that's the deeper part here is that you know uh, people just you don't want to live in a world where we believe that these things can just happen out of the blue you know mm. um so we want to sure. try figure it out and join dots and kind of find the evil people who orchestrated this and and blame it on somebody yes because the idea that we are not in control induces so much anxiety that we're going to create yeah. ways to you know prop that up and go no actually we are in control yeah and i mean i mean the covid the pandemic has definitely show that we don't have control exactly and that has driven you know so many so many people just insane exactly. because they don't have control which shows there's somebody behind you know who's controlling everything and we believe the lord is is in control of ev- of all things you know he's sovereign over everything uh but yeah i just it's it's interesting that there's that idol of control there mm. you know uh beneath this you know diversion or pulling out things so we could pin it so we can gain a sense of control. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, control and I think just the sense that we need 
we need things to make sense. Life mm. needs to be predictable. Yeah. You know, and what's unpredictable, uncontrollable just generates anxiety. And I think a part of some of the conspiracy theories around COVID was to generate some sense of mm. we can make sense of this. And often's why we just can't make sense of yeah. it this time. And we learn to trust God. That's yeah. just the bottom line. Yeah. There's some things we're not going to know. Yeah. You know, Even this side of eternity, why the pandemic happened. I think we can see beautiful things that have come out of it. But mm. honestly, some things we're not going to know. Humans yeah. want to know, but some of these things belong to the Lord. Yeah. And bottom line is for Christians is that we have to just trust the things that we don't know mm. to the hands of God. So maybe I'll just end by saying that because sure. I think I've been, one of my hobby horses is very anti-conspiracy theories. Yeah. But in doing some of this research, I, I kind of did see another side to it, you mm. know? So, so the other, on the, cause on the other hand as Christians, we also got to be aware that, I mean, Jesus warns in these end times, there will be those who deceive and all these crazy disruptions will happen yes. in the world. And, and so we have to be watchful mm. and alert for, you know, and human beings are sinister and wicked. And, and mm. so we, you know, Paul is talking about false teachers yeah. here. And so we are looking at being attentive to things. Yeah. So, that's the one side of it is, yes, we want to be alert and watchful. The other side is also, I was reminded as I was doing this research about these different levels of conspiracy theories and psychologically what classifies something as a conspiracy theory. And lo and behold, in the secular research, under these categories of what is a conspiracy theory mm. is, you guessed it, Christianity. Sure. Well, parts of Christianity. Yes. For example, you know, huh. secular people will say that those, I mean, here, I'll just read a, um, a quick quote to you. Sure. Uh, those who believe in the resurrection of Christ are, quote, dangerous to others and themselves mm. in need of psychological help. <laughs> so we realize to a world, actually, this is, you know, you it's know. It's foolish. Yeah. So I think there's, yeah. there's things that we believe as, as, as Christians that in the eyes of others mm. is, you know, falls on the, yeah. the spectrum of, Way out there, crazy, yeah. Bigfoot, you know, the yeah. Loch Ness Monster, the resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so, yeah, sure. we've got to realize, like, you know, within ourselves as Christians, we're easy to paint the sides of what's conspiracy and what's crazy. But to a watching world, we've got to realize, you know, to them, mm. you know, there is this sense of Christianity, you know, has these elements to it that are that are kind of tough to believe. Yeah. And so we want to recognize that yeah. as well. I suppose sure. the bottom line is this conclusion. Then we'll, um, uh, you can comment why and then maybe we'll move yeah. on. But the conclusion is this, I think. What, what's the advice to Christians? Hmm. And my advice to Christians with conspiracy theories is mainly don't be obsessed. Sure. Don't be obsessed. Mm. That's the point of First Timothy here, yeah. is they are diverted and distracted mm. by it. It leads them away from the stewardship from God that is by faith, the yeah. gospel message. Don't be obsessed. Yeah. There is unhealthy obsession with this stuff. It's different to be uh, knowledgeable about them, mm. to even be perhaps interested in them yeah. um, is a stretch, but maybe, but obsessed is that's when yeah. you are harming yourself because it's diverting you from mm. the real gospel truths. It's yeah. leading to dissension, everything we spoke about. So my simple advice is you can be knowledgeable without being obsessed. Sure. Don't be obsessed. That's what Paul's warning against here. No, I mean, you've put it perfectly. I don't want to add anything to it. I mean, I want to add, but I just think that's an important you know, point, you know, the, the point of this thing is mm. be careful. Right. You know, be careful because some have walked away from the faith. Like, Indeed. be careful, you know. So, Rich, let's, let's get into the, the correct use of the law. Mm. Um, you, you took us through it. Uh, you know, you looked at different sections. I think I really enjoyed uh, just looking at you know, uh, what, what is the purpose of the law? Because the burning question that I have, you know, uh, coming out of, from my scratch pad was, um, can we view the law? What, what's our view of the law today um, in light of the gospel? 
Mm. You know, uh, but I want you to get into that. Maybe we'll get into some of those questions, uh, time permitting. But let's just get into the the correct use of the law. Yeah, we'll get into some questions and we'll mm. get into some extra material that yeah. that was on my scratch pad that make it into the into the sermon, yes. and that I hope will kind of just elevate <clears throat> the discussion and give some more nuance to it. But the question is, what is the that Christian view of the law? Mm. So verse eight, the law is good. Yep but it must be used lawfully. Yes. That's why we could not ignore doing this subject because mm. it speaks about there is a proper place for the law. law. Yeah. And I spent some time and you, you alluded it in the beginning of the law here refers to at the least mm. the 613 law codes, but actually far more than that. Jesus sure. used the law as a reference to the mm. first five books of the Bible sure. in general, not just the law code, etc. So the point is when Paul says the law, he's not talking about the law in Ephesus, he's not talking about the speed limit. <laughs> he's talking <laughs> yeah. about his Bible that he carried with him. Mm. Plus today, as we read that, all of the instructions in the New Testament. So the law is good. In other mm. words, we're not libertarians. Mm. We're not people mm. who have no sense of there is no such thing as, um, mm. as, as law. And we're not antinomians. I'm sure you've come across that phrase. But it's kind of, mm. um, you know, this idea that th as Christians, there's no such thing as any legally binding instruction yeah. for us. Everything is obedience that is purely internally motivated. And let me tell you, I mean, that's a big discussion. Yeah. You know? But basically, verse 8, the law is good, means we're not libertarians, mm. we're not antinomians, but you have to use it properly. Lovely, yeah. So the, the law must exist in people's minds. As Christians, yeah. we've got to see the Old Testament texts, mm. even the weird law codes, that's what I went in the sermon, as instructive. That's why Torah must be translated instruction. Yes. Because even though the direct application may not be legally binding in a statutory sense, yes. they are instructive in what they are revealing about God, yes. revealing about us, us yeah. revealing about the way we are supposed to love him and love others in a way that leads to flourishing. Yeah. So the entire Bible is instructive. Yeah. Even the commandments, even mm. the weird codes. That, that's what we're saying here is don't chop out. Mm. You know, don't be a, a, a little blue Bible Christian only where the Old Testament no longer is needed exactly, because, yeah. you, you know, you believed in Jesus and you can just cut that all away mm. and now just obey the New Testament. And mm. even the commands in the New Testament don't even worry about that stuff. That's <laughs> kind of antinomianism yeah. is just, you know. I mean, yeah, yeah doing that would be actually rejecting what Christ said. You exactly. know, he says, I've come yeah. to fulfill it. Yeah. You know, so, you know, he's not abolishing the law. He's not saying it's irrelevant. Matthew 5 verse 17, exactly. it's so clear. And I mentioned it on Sunday. Yeah. I did get a question from somebody who asked me, mm. can you explain your view on the law in light of Matthew 5 17? Mm. And I just want to, you know, say to that person, I think it did deal with it in the sermon mm. quite extensively, you know, yeah. that Je what Jesus meant when he said fulfilled. Yeah. But that, I think the point is he did not abolish it. He didn't say, guys, I'm now here. Yeah. What I'm going to do is going to make everything that has preceded my coming irrelevant. Hmm. He didn't say that. Yeah. But he said he was he was going to fulfill it. And we went into three reasons of how Jesus hmm. fulfilled it. I don't think we have time to go into that yeah. in, the, in the podcast today. But the, the point is the whole Bible is instructive. Yeah. The law is good. There's a good purpose to us mm. reading through even weird commands is a very good purpose to us mm. being paying very careful attention to New yeah. Testament instructions. I mean, Paul then goes into that list, doesn't mm. he, why of yeah. like all of these, you know, what un the law is not for the uh, just, but the unjust. Just, and then yes. he goes into explaining, mm. gives these categories and he talks about sexual sin. Sexual he immorality. talks about yeah. violence, yeah. children beating their parents. He talks sure. about lying, perjury, Slave trade. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. do you read that and go, well, that's law, but we're not under law. Yeah. So actually I can, I can be yeah. sexually promiscuous because I'm under grace, yeah. you know? So yeah. that's the whole sense is sure. we, as Christians, we, there's a rightful place mm. for, what has been called the law, but generally we're saying when you mm. come across scripture that seems to say thou shalt or shalt not, and it prompts us to behave a certain way, yeah. gather all of those up, 
That's what we mean by law. And to a Christian, we pay attention to that Old and New Testament. Sure. And uh, I mean, Jesus fleshes out a lot more of the commandments given. I mean, for instance, yes. you know, about adultery, you know, he, he goes into detail. He says, well, actually, if you look at a woman with lustful intent, you've already committed adultery in your heart. You know, so he fleshes it out more, you know. Um, yes. So it's not just, you know, the physical act of it only, but it's also in our thought life, mm. you know, so which, again, just proves the relevance of the law today. You know? Exactly. That's a great point. And in fact, it's another little rabbit trail we could go down. Mm. But, you know, you say you use the words Jesus you know, fleshes out the command, one of the Ten Commands, you know, commit adultery. I would, I would say, I mean, that, that's, that's correct, but I would tr- even use a little more specific language and say what Jesus is doing is mm. drawing out the basic principle, principle yeah. behind that commandment, which is applicable yeah. across time and across culture. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the great challenge when reading some of these. And I gave mm-hmm. the example of, of Deuteronomy uh, yes. you know, 25 with the do not muzzle an ox. And yes. Paul quotes that and very specifically you know, in a New Testament context. But maybe yeah. while I'm there now, let me just come across, um, let me just do another, another little example of that. So after sure. the sermon, this wasn't a question that came in via email. But I um, was chatting to someone after the sermon, Stephen, and, and he said to me, um, you know, because I made the challenge, go through all those commands and discern yes. the principle, which is what Jesus, you know, was really yeah. drawing out is not just the direct application, yeah. but the principle. Um, and so here's another just quick one. So Deuteronomy 20 verse 19. Um, and by the way, I just completely stole this example from um, Bible Project guys. Yeah. I just want to give a quick shout out there's why if I can. Yeah, please do it. Because man. a ton of my learning here came mm. from this. There's a six part series, podcast series. So the Bible Project, for those who don't know, mm. just go type Bible Project, you come across it. There's yeah. videos of summaries of themes, summaries books, of books yeah. of the Bible, five sure. to seven minute videos, amazing. Yeah. But then there's the podcast where guys do this, what you and I are doing. Yeah. <laughs> and they just discuss. And so there's a six part series on the law. And I listened to three of them and I read the transcripts for the other three. Immense detail on, on sure. a lot of these things. But they go into this little example. So I want to give a shout out there because guys, if they want to do a deep dive, I just highly recommend that. Yeah. The six part yeah. series no, they, on the law. By Bible amazing, man. So, yeah. But they give this example, Deuteronomy 20, Deuteronomy 20 verse 19. When you besiege, so the, the title there is um, Commands for Warfare. Hmm. So you're like, what? I mean, <laughs> I don't intend to start a war. <laughs> Should I start a war? No, I shouldn't. So ready, you're in weird territory. But then you come to this command. It says, when you besiege a city for a long time, making war against it in order to take it, you shall not destroy its trees by wielding an axe against them. So you may eat from the trees, but don't cut them and don't cut them down. Are the trees in the field human that they should be besieged by you? Like what a what a weird like hmm. instruction, like today we're not going, I'm not going to, I'm not about to start a war. So, I mean, thanks, but like, but actually behind it is this kind of just beautiful picture about how, you know, that life in these trees of, you know, in, in warfare, what would happen, like the Assyrians especially, was it mm. like a, they would go in and destroy everything, like just completely destroy houses, but also like part of the, the natural creation. And basically the command here is like, hey man, leave creation out of it. Mm. Like leave God's creation out of this, yeah. your war. You know, so don't just destroy it for the sake of destroying it. And so you think about that principle, mm. I mean like, you know, about how human beings can relate to the creation and the environment you know, in, in a way of you doing this big human, this building project and there's wisdom about honoring the beauty of creation mm. in the midst of a building sure. project, you know. Sure. So anyway, just I wanted to jump, you know, yeah. jump there. But maybe what we need to do is, what I'd like to do is mm-hmm. just run through. So I had the six points in the yes. sermon, um, but I want, I want to start just from the back and just do the last two because mm-hmm. that's the inherent question is the law is good mm-hmm. as long as it's used lawfully. So what's good use? And what's bad the use? Bad use of it, yeah. so, so let's start with with the good use, and sure. we'll just run through a few little extra things, and we'll get to another major question. So I said, okay. So the proper use of the law is first to reveal the source of our brokenness. Yeah. I mean, I won't go into what I said in the sermon because I deliberately put that in as 
part of a sermon part, but to actually talk a little bit more about this larger use of the law in the sense that um, it, it's supposed to expose, show us the nature of God, mm. show us our nature, and therefore expose the massive gap sure. between yes. us and God. And so I quote, let me quote Bible Project here again. So these guys said that the laws play an important but ultimately subordinate role in the plot of the larger biblical storyline that leads to Jesus. Mm. I think that's an important statement that's going to put a lot of Christians at ease. Mm. Let's read that again. The laws play an important but subordinate role in the plot of the Mm. biblical storyline that leads to Jesus. Mm. Humanity's failure to obey the divine command is part of the plot conflict that prevents them from being God's image partners in ruling creation. So the laws illustrate the divine ideal while also intensifying the conflict, creating the need for a new human and a new covenant. Mm. It's like well put. So N.T. Wright actually puts it like this, that the laws are like a magnifying glass. Well, on the one hand, they magnify the holiness of God, but at the very same time, magnify humanity's sinfulness. So at a very large level, the law sits as this weight that reveals to us our need for a Messiah. Sure. And so the law was never intended to save. You know, the law has never been, you know, put out as the way to end a place or, you know, law abiding you know, as it were, it's not, it's not the way to end or to close that gap that exists between humanity or that chasm mm. that exists between humanity and God. But it should do something. Correct. Like law, law is instructive. So that, that was part B is it mm. drives us to Jesus. Yeah. So it's not that the law has no role to play mm. in the gospel. It does have a role to play. Absolutely. Its role isn't to justify, mm. but its role is to lead us to the one who justifies. Amen. So again, don't separate the law. Yeah. Don't, don't take it out. It has this beautiful, noble purpose mm. of magnifying the holiness of God at mm. the same time magnifying our depravity. And in that gap, we're like, what do I do? And it drives us to the one law keeper. Yes. The one who fulfilled the law yeah. by keeping yeah. the law yeah. perfectly, fulfilled the righteous demands of the law. Sure. And through whom we are justified. Yeah. So we'll get to that. That's like, you know, the improper use of the law is to justify. It's yeah. the rich young ruler who went to Jesus and yeah. it says, looking to justify himself, exactly. said, yeah. which are the commandments? And Jesus said, well, you tell me. He said, the 10 commandments, I've kept all of them since mm. youth. Which is a lie. Yeah. And yeah. Jesus then pointed out his materialism. Mm. and But the whole point is he was trying to justify himself. himself. He was trying yeah. to go, he has 10 commands. I've done it. Done mm. it, I'm good. Yeah. So it's wrong to say the law has no role to play in our salvation. It does. It does. It it drives us to Jesus. The law doesn't justify, but it leads us to the one who does justify. So I think that was the first point and the second point. Mm. um, In fact, let me read from the Westminster Catechism. I refer to this in in the sermon. It has this kind of old school language that's super heavy and quite cool. So so it says this, question 96 in the Westminster Catechism is, what particular use is there of the moral law to unregenerate men? Hmm. That's Paul's question here. It's like the law as a place for unregenerate is a synonym for the unjust, Unjust, the unsaved. So the question is, what use is there? And the answer is the moral law. So here they mean not just law code, Old Testament, moral law through the Bible. The moral law is of use to unregenerate men to awaken their consciences, Mm. consciences, (laughs) struggle to say that on Sunday as well. (laughs) I heard that. (laughs) To awaken their consciences to flee from wrath to come and to drive them to Christ or upon their continuance in the estate and way of sin to leave them inexcusable and under the curse thereof. (laughs) So like, guys, don't throw out the law. Mm. It's just, it has this massive purpose in revealing our brokenness, not mm. to condemn, but to lead us to the to place Jesus, of yeah. justification and healing. Mm. And that's the point. That whole list is not to people read that list and go, that's me, I'm condemned. It's, it's to go, well, yes, but 
the solution is Jesus in whom is complete forgiveness mm. and cleansed from sin. Those Old Testament sure. pictures, restoration, mm. righteousness. I mean, it's it's a beautiful, it's hard, but it's beautiful, the use of yeah. the law to reveal our brokenness and drive us to Jesus. And, and that um, re- revelation of our brokenness uh, doesn't only happen at the point of, you know, as you're investigating who Christ is and coming into faith, it doesn't end there, mm-hmm. uh, even in our mm-hmm. lives currently as Christians. Yes. You know, as we interact with God's word, uh, you know, it reveals how broken and how, how much we don't match up. That's so good. You know, yeah. uh, and that should continually drive us. Yeah. Um, uh, that's coming up actually on the same on the Sunday. But that, could, that should continually drive us to the one to who... the person of Jesus. Exactly, you know. Yeah, because law keeping on its own, and this will lead us to the next part, is goodliness. <laughs> like God, <laughs> Godliness is He, it's yeah, Jesus. Exactly. And you're absolutely right, Sai. Yeah. So whenever I'm reading through the Bible devotionally myself, mm. and I come across the moral law, yes. and I get convicted of my sin, mm. it's not to condemn, yeah. you know, it's to reveal to me that I'm not aligned with God's intended sure. way, that I can love Him and love others and lead yeah. to flourishing in my life. And what does that do? It draws me back to Him. Sure. So, it's good. Yeah, it's important. I mean, I think just it touches on the aspect of repentance. You know, I've come across a lot of Christians who are guilt-ridden, right. you know. Uh, I mean, sin is shameful. But, you know, understanding the moral law, you know, should push you to realize that actually the one whom you've trusted in has died for your sins, has yes. died for that particular sin that you might yes. be shameful over, you know, um, and that should lead you to, to turn away from it and run to him, you know, which I just find, I find so, um, yeah, just, it, it's so liberating. It doesn't liberate one to go on and sin so that grace may abound, but it just, it means that I'm not going to be paralyzed by mm-hmm. my sin, you know. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep choosing you yeah. know, Christ, I'm going to keep going to him. I mean, that is, yeah, your sermon, the passage coming up, it's that whole list of all, you know, what the the law is, you know, pointing the unjust as, a, you mm-hmm. know, sexually immoral, enslavers, liars, perjurers, whatever yeah. else. But then the very next sentence or the, the heading in the yeah. next section in my Bible, the heading is Christ Jesus came, came. to save sinners. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe I want to just jump to, you're probably going to run out, I'm probably out of time, but so... Um, yeah. Maybe just the one last question that I that I that I got, which is from Michael. Mm. Is this the lockdown legend? <laughs> well, I didn't want or to expose Michael. him, but uh, but yeah, when <laughs> when I when I saw it was from the the lockdown legend, I'm like, ooh, this is going to be a tough one, and it is. So it's an important one. So maybe <laughs> read it. Let for me us read we'll it first. Yeah. This, yeah. Uh, in your message, your last point was that an unlawful use of the law is for sanctification. When you spoke up, when you spoke about it, you instead used a phrase that. An unlawful use of the law is to make us better people. So he's paraphrasing. Can you elaborate on how this view aligns with your other passages, like Exodus 19, where it says that if you indeed obey, or Jeremiah 31, where God says that I will put my spirit in you and cause you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey all my rules. While I think I would probably agree that outward obedience to the law in and of itself doesn't necessarily make make us holy or good people, there's surely a sense in Scripture that if we are saved and have God's Spirit in us, we'll be moved towards obedience mm. and find God's law useful and satisfying, as an example of um, as in the example of Psalm 119. Would appreciate if you could elaborate on that. Yes. So. Even just that last little quote, like Psalm 119, yeah. I was going to use this on Sunday as well, mm. but it's all these refrains about delighting in the law. Mm. And again, the law, their Torah, so it's delighting in the revelation of who God is. It's not delighting in statutory legal code. Mm. No one, you can, no one's going to delight in that. What you're delighting in is the God behind it, right? So, sure. so to answer Michael's question, I, I suppose what I would say now is um, that. So, so just the context there is that the improper use of the law. So we just went over the proper use so yes. to drive us to Jesus, essentially. The improper use is to justify. 
So we spoke about that already. But the second improper use is to sanctify. Mm. And the idea on Sunday was the idea that this kind of, if I just read these commands and will myself and live by them, that I will actually change. Mm. Like, no, that's goodliness. That's goodliness, not godliness. So it's this external mm. behavior through our own will and effort without it being connected to Jesus. And on Sunday, I was really trying to connect that to the Holy Spirit as well. Mm. That's goodness. And, and I think I wanna, wanna end here because I think if we remove the Holy Spirit from this discussion mm. on law and the proper use of the law and our sanctification, then we are missing the entire sense of the new covenant. Yeah. Because Ezekiel 36 in particular Put, yeah. pointed to the spirit's Put, role, yeah. the hard heart, the soft heart. Jeremiah pointed to it being written internally. Yeah. So we cannot miss the role of the Holy Spirit. Spirit and I would, let me give a little thought experiment here um, to Mark and to everybody listening, and then I'll double back and just answer his question clearly. But the thought experiment is this. Let's say you, Dwight, we're on a mission trip. Uh, we go to people who've never heard of Christianity. Yeah. We share the gospel with them. They believe in Jesus. Maybe we don't have scriptures in their translation, but they've made a genuine profession of faith. Mm. The Holy Spirit has sealed them. Yeah. He's living in them. And now we got to go. we got to leave. Question, would, does that person stand a chance of living, of, of, of being convicted of their sin in their yeah. ways? of changing hmm. and actually we go back a year later, they still haven't had access to the scriptures. They still haven't been able to read any Torah moral law, yeah. but the spirit on its own has done a work of sanctification. Yes. yes or no? I think, yeah. Good. Me too. Yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. And that's where <laughs> there's all this, you know, that's where some of the antinomian kind of stuff comes from. Like, yes, we believe in mm. the spirit is the one, the law is written on their hearts, yeah. you know, uh, but you know, other, you know, thought experiment, you know, other side of that thought experiment is, you know, somebody who um, just does this um, idea of, um, you know, reads the Bible alone and no sense of the Holy Spirit. Mm. So no sense of, you know, the, God and being in personal relationship with God and they're yeah. just running through this checklist. Will they end up being actually internally changed, sanctified? We spoke about this last week in podcast. Mm. Answer is, is no, that's no. goodliness, not godliness, yeah. you know. So I think that's what I was trying to emphasize. Um, but the better way, a better way to put it, so, so Michael has pointed out something really great here because I would rephrase what I said there because I wouldn't say that the law cannot sanctify in a sense that it has no role to play in sanctification. Just the same as I would clarify the way we just did that the, I wouldn't say the law has no role to play in justifying. Mm. It has a role to play in justifying, and it has a role to play in sanctifying, but mm. the law alone cannot sanctify. Mm. I would change that statement. Yeah. I would change it from the law cannot satisfy to the law alone, alone. Oh, satisfy, sanctify. <laughs> the law alone, <laughs> yeah. alone cannot sanctify. So it's just mm. a great question because yeah. I don't mean to say that it has no role to play in yeah. your sanctification. It, it, it surely does. And yeah. just to say it has no role in this justification, it has a role to play, but it not alone. Yeah. You know? And in the same way, the law alone cannot sanctify. Uh, I mean, the interesting discussion is, can the spirit alone sanctify? <laughs> <laughs> and I would say, <laughs> just, yes, yeah. but the answer is God <laughs> has given his law yeah. as the primary means by which he reveals his will. So the spirit yeah. works in conjunction with the yeah. word and works in conjunction sure. with the law. So you don't, you shouldn't separate that thought experiment is not, you know, is not prescriptive Yes, because um, the law and the spirit go together. Yeah. And so I'd probably just tie up that statement like that. So Sure. Thank you so much, Rich. Um, this has been Rich, you know, uh, discussing this. Uh, and I hope you're listening at home. You really found this helpful. And if you've got any more questions, you know, please engage with us. Uh, send them through. We are out of time. Um, yeah, but looking forward to, to more engagement as we dive into First Timothy. Thank you for joining us. And to flipping the mark on you next week because you're yeah. preaching. So. <laughs> <laughs> looking forward to that, man. Yeah. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, everyone.